So, so, so just moving on a little bit, um, we, we talk uh, in terms of our podcast and lessons and stuff that, uh, you know, that have sort of come up is that, that we say it's so important to talk about your story and say your story. And, and you also, you, you sort of term it slightly differently. You, said, you say, remember who you are. Why are these things so important? Oh, because we are all here. I really, truly really believe we're all here to change the world. And we're all here, we're all completely different. And who we are is light and love. Who Our natural state is joy. And it's like, you know, hashtag adulting. We forget all of that. So many people go to jobs they hate. They, they feel like they can't leave them. They're in relationships that don't set their souls on fire. They feel their whole description of their day is I have to do this. I have to do this. You hear people talking in line about, it's just one complaint. They're just complaining together. When we remember who we are, we remember how supported we are by the universe. We remember that like, we're not supposed to know what we're doing. We're like our soul made these decisions for us. That's the human design gives us that piece. And we're just here to figure it out as we go along. We're here to experiment. We can't screw this up. Yeah, we, yeah, it's so true. Give give yourself permission to just live and be, and do, and and yeah, it's such a it's a great reminder. And I guess gratitude also like flows into that somewhere. You know, like remember what you have. Remember what the things you do really thrive at and are, you know, doing well at in your life. And it's such a great reminder, isn't it? Yeah, there's a quote. Um, I've seen it around the triathlon community. It's like, there will be a day when I cannot do that. Do this. Today is not that day. Hmm. And that's such a good reminder for everything in our lives. There will be a day I can't do this. Today hmm. is not that day. So I'm going to do it. Hmm. That's totally. really I, yeah, powerful. Yeah. It is very powerful. I, I actually, I always like actually say that to myself in, in uh, many instances, you know, like, so for example, if, if, if I'm like, because I live in London. So if I'm going, yeah, I see the stairs on the tube or I can take the escalator or the stairs basically, you know, and I'm like, there's going to be one day in my life, you know, I might be 80 or whatever the age is where I will not be able to take these stairs and I will wish that I can take these stairs. Mm. So I must take them today for that, for that person in the future that's going to wish that they could do it. You know what I mean? Rather than kind of just be a little bit lazy and stand down on the escalator and go up because you have to think about your life. I think you have to be strategic in how you think about your life, you know, like, um, not, you know, to, you don't have to be like super regimented about it, but I still think it is important to think about your future self and how they're going to, um, reflect on some of these moments. And, um, you know, you don't want to have regrets as well. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I believe in, I think there's, it's called memento mori is a reminder that we're all going to die that can feel really morbid and I'm not into it from that perspective necessarily because I, if I found out I was going to die tomorrow, I would just go hug my husband and my dog and not really want to do anything else. But if I think of this might be the last time I, you know, I'm biking and I'm like, this might be the last time I'm going down this trail. You know, that could be because I'm going to die. It could be because our tornado is going to come in and take out the whole trail. Like who knows? But that, when we do that, when I do that, things get brighter. Like the, the flowers on the trees right. pop a little more. And I think that's, it's really important to remember that we, we're not in charge of the timeline. Totally. I do the same thing. I have this personal rule. My dog is 12 and a half now. And whenever he asks me to play, I say, yes, I will stop hmm. what I'm doing. And go play with him because cool. one day he's not going to ask me to play. Mm, yeah. one day he's not going to be there. That's so true. It's like just another way of framing it that I often think of is like the thing that you're doing that you never know when it's the last time. You just, you don't know. Like there will, it, there will always be a last time of everything. The last time 
that you send an email. You, you don't know when that is, which was your last email you ever sent in your life. Or, you know, you can extrapolate that into every little thing in your life. And uh, yeah, you can really take sad. it to a much less morbid place. Like yeah. the last time I ate gluten, like I didn't, I didn't actually document that moment, but That's, yeah, you never knew that would be your last one. Right. You know what I mean? It was and, my last uh, but, piece of wheat <laughs> flour bread. <laughs> Exactly. But it's, but it's, uh, I think it, as you said in the beginning, it's like kind of, you could use it as a real positive thing in your life as a, you know, mm -hmm. just having the, that reflection, knowing that that is a reality. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really good. So, you know, talking about, you know, strategies for life, uh, you, you know, you've spoken about your inner critic. Are you, do you still like see that there in your background? Does it still come up inside of you or have you kind of totally, as you mentioned earlier, transform the way it affects you? I've completely transformed it. Sometimes, so the physical feeling we get from our inner critic is it's like we're going to cry, scream, jump up and down, dance, hide under a rock all at the same time. And did I say throw up? Because that's in there too. <laughs> like just this physical wave of like, yeah, like super squirminess. I can see it when it happens to people. And sometimes I'll get a little bit of that, but I don't get the chatter in my head at all anymore. That's hmm. great. Yeah, that's great. It's a nice, it's a nice change. That's for sure. And um, one of the things you talk about in your coaching, and it's obviously like this, this word keeps on repeating itself and in, in all your stuff is, is awesome. And you say that everyone has awesome in them. So like, how do you get people to believe and find out what their awesome is? So that's part of remembering who you are. We're all born with this unique spark and that's our gift to the world. It's completely different for all of us. And I think they were born knowing what it is, but we don't have the language skills yet to do anything with it. We don't have the physical skills to do anything with it yet. So by the time we are, we have the intelligence and the skills and all that to do something with it, we have been so conditioned by so many people telling us that we're not worthy, that we are supposed to work a nine to five job, that we're supposed to go to med school or law school or do that. We're supposed to make this much money, have this many kids. We've got so much of that. And I picture it like putting on layers of clothes and we're just like our awesome is under there and we're wearing 200 t-shirts on top <laughs> but we gotta cut that off like you're gonna be able to move a lot more comfortably once you can once you're not restricted in all those t-shirts mm. and just let it shine it's in some sense it's like let your inner freak flag shine i've seen people <laughs> post stuff like that like we are all total weirdos. And if you want to look at it that way, I just look at it like we are all, we have within us this unique spark, this inner genius, this inner brilliance, and that is our awesome. And we are here to share that with the world. The world needs it. The world is waiting for it. The world is craving it from us. And it's our, our gift to give it to them. It is. So at this stage, Karen, things were, were going pretty well, it seemed, and, and, uh, and swimmingly in your life. And at 29, tragedy actually struck your life. Um, and it would change uh, forever when uh, Richard, your husband, who you had been in love with, uh, was, was murdered. Yeah. In an instant, everything changed. In an instant. So sad. Like, what actually happened? So we were, um, we were living in Orlando, and I was working as a recruiter. And the day that this happened, I had, um, an, I had interviews that I needed to do from home, which I normally didn't do. I was very good as, as far as like leaving work at work. Um, specifically because Richard had just opened up a CrossFit gym. And so we were about six months into business. And so once I left work, I was, you know, coming to the next phase of life, which was picking up the kids and um, helping him with the gym. And just so 
So it was very unusual for me to have to do um, any interviews after hours. But I was interviewing um, some VPs, and so that was their availability. So that morning, I remember texting them and just saying, hey, you know, my schedule is now going, rolling over to the evening. I have some interviews to do. Do you want me to pick up the kids or do you want me to just go home and you can bring them home later? And so he said, no, you know, they've missed you. So uh, why don't you come pick them up? And so I said, okay. And um, so I went, I picked up the kids and I got a phone call from someone while I was on my way to get them. And so he just piled them into the car. I gave him a wave and, and left. Um, so when I got home, I, my son was two at the time and we had my stepdaughter with me, which is why I say kids. Um, but she, uh, I dropped her off at her mom's house before I, I went home. And so my son was sitting in front of the TV. I just got him situated and I was on my first call on the first interview. I had three of them scheduled. So I was on the interview and I was using the house phone, but my cell phone was vibrating. And so I noticed it had been vibrating for a while, but because it was face down, I wasn't really thinking about it. It was a call, probably was thinking it was an alarm or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I finally turned it over and I saw that it was a missed call from one of the women who was a member at our gym. And so I thought to myself, hmm, that's interesting. Well, maybe Richard hurt himself. So I don't know if either of you CrossFit, have you all been a CrossFit no, box? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, of the CrossFit <laughs> right. boxes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. So, you know, we have those big rigs, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. in my mind, I'm thinking he fell off the rig. Yeah. Maybe he broke his arm. Maybe he hit his head, which is why she's calling me. So finally, the candidate um, was answering a question and I put him on mute to answer her phone call just to say, hey, is everything all right? What's up? You know, yeah. I'm doing an interview. And all I heard was screaming. No and worries. I couldn't make out um, like what she was saying. I honestly don't even remember if I was hearing people in the back as well, but it just sounded like complete pandemonium. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the only word I could make out was shot. And it was like, it was instant. As soon as I heard that word, my body just started trembling. It's like it was going into convulsions. And so I had to gather myself because remember I had the candidate on the phone. So I got off the phone with her. I hit unmute with him and tried to with a steady voice say, thank you so much for your time. We'll be in touch with next steps in the next week or so and just hurry up and get off the phone. And so I picked up my son and um, I remember bouncing him because my first thought was, I don't want him to feel what's happening to my body. And then, you know, for that to trigger something sure. in. Him. And so I took him to the neighbor's house and I just said, if you can watch him, you know, I'll, I don't know what happened at the gym, but something happened. She said, sure. I go a hundred and something down the highway. And it wasn't until, um, until the light right before the gym that I, I remember thinking to myself, why am I not on my way to the hospital? Because if this woman had called me several times and I didn't answer for a few minutes, and if it took me at least 10 minutes to get here, after all this mm. time, if he was shot, we should be headed to the hospital. And so I pull up and it's just, there's first responders everywhere. There's news reporters there. There's news trucks out there. There's people from the community. There's people from church. I mean, it was just, um, it was chaos. And, um, and I don't remember who told me or when they told me, uh, that he died and, and died instantly. Um, but that, that was the night that my, that my life changed. Wow. So sad. Like, I can't believe like, like so, so just someone came and just shot, shot him. Like, do they, do they know who the person is? What, what actually happened? No. So six years later, they still don't um, have the shooter identified or um, he, so the story, I didn't ask a lot of questions. Uh, the people who were in there, Richard was teaching a class when this happened and the person walked in and he was standing by the chalkboard, I think writing people's times or something. And it was a guy. So this guy must've said something and he turned around and the guy shot him and he, um, and he died instantly because this, this man shot him in the head. Mm. And he, um, there was a getaway driver. And so he got in the car. Um, we mm. were in an industrial park area. So somebody, one of the other tenants, I think, tried to follow them for a little bit. 
Um, but no, nope, to this day, we still don't have, they did, you know, they said, well, clearly this was a hit, but we can't find the motive. Wow. That's did, insane. No, no one could like ID him or anything that sort. Mm -mm. Uh, mm -mm. Oh, they were working out. Oh, wow. That's so sad. And, um, and yeah, sorry. Go, go. No, no, go for it. Go no, I'm done. Um, so, I mean, I mean, it's really impossible really for us to kind of fathom how, how you must take news like that. Like so much go, must go through your mind. Like what now? And what about our son? And like, where do you, where do you begin? Hmm. So the first night, um, I rem I remember being at the crime scene and sitting behind a bush, just rocking back and forth, just saying, this isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real. Cause that's, that's just all I, I couldn't even think. Um, at some point you are thinking now what? That's exactly what you're thinking because you just, you don't even know what direction to go. Um, when we were there at the crime scene, at one point a police officer came up to me and said, Mrs. Millsap, you're going to have to call someone to clean up in there. Mm. And so when he said this, I remember thinking, first I was thinking, what the hell? Like, I'm, I mean, you know, I, I say, I, I say it lightly now, but I, it was very, it was a lot of anger when I was in my head, like, just, I can't even believe that this person has said this to me. And so I got out, I said, well, what do you mean? Like, who do I call? I, no, actually I said, isn't that something you all do? And he said, no. And I said, well, who do I call? And he said, crime scene cleanup. And I no said, well, way. how do I even find them? And his response was, you can look in the yellow pages. No ways. No, hmm. like sympathy nothing what's that's it? unbelievable mm -hmm. and this is and like so, a day this is like a day or two later the crime scene. no this is at the crime scene that night wow oh my god while we're standing in the parking lot oh, and tragic. so as i was standing there um thankfully uh my pastor was there and he came right over to me and he said um karen don't worry about it we'll take care of it and I, I, I remember even before he came up to me in that space, I remember thinking to myself, this is my first responsibility as a widow. And then I was thinking, wait, wow. I'm a widow. Like I, I just couldn't. And so, you know, Craig, to your point, it was like, now what, like, what is, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. But when you, when you go through something and I can't speak for everybody's experience, but in this kind of traumatic experience, you literally can't think about what to do next. Yet the only thing that was given to me was an insensitive remark of, Hey, now you got to go clean up in there. Like it, so I couldn't even try to think about what to do next because you know, this was just dumped on me. I'm so sorry. But actually, yeah, just before we, we discuss uh, your, your book in more detail um, and you're just talking now about the posts that you're doing and the right things you're doing, I don't know if it's maybe just me, but one of the messages which seems to be coming across is like this kind of new age masculinity that you kind of uh, are speaking about and, and portraying. Like, what does that actually really mean and, and why is it important? Well, I think it's important because I think we're living through an incredible era with Time's Up and Me Too. And it feels, you know, for some people, it feels wonky or choppy and confusing because we're living through it right now and i and i do think whether we want to call it the current political climate or who might be in our white house here in the states but i think there are certain catalysts that are and, and it's just not one you know but certain catalysts that have sparked this to come up and for us to have greater awareness around you know the opportunities that we give to women uh, what it means to be a, 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 a male today, a guy today, uh, equal opportunity for people, diversity on many fronts. Like we're, it's all coming together. And I think the internet's definitely helped us out to say, hey, like, oh yeah, like before I just thought I was like the only one. Now I can like go online and see I'm not the only one. There are people yeah. like me. And so now this is all coming together through social media and in our conference rooms and in our in our, our kitchen tables, in our communities, and it, it's all new. And mm -hmm. it feels 
for some it feels scary mm. for some it feels like invigorating and it's messy and you know for me I, you know, i'm the byproduct of some great female mentorship throughout my career and i also you know got involved because i wanted i wanted a better world for my daughters hmm. you know, my daughters who are just as competent as the guys they go to school with when they become professionals and they go out in the workforce, they should get paid what another competent guy gets paid. Mm -hmm. To me, that's like a no brainer. And for every company out there, they can make that change happen like today. Yeah. Right. It, that, that doesn't need more analysis. It just needs the courage to make the damn decision. Mm. And so when I joined the healthcare business women's association, because that's an advocacy group within healthcare, really trying to promote gender parity, which is a big umbrella topic, but equal pay, opportunities, uh, value and diversity. I did it when the girls were really young because I wanted a different world. Now they're 18 and 21 and the world hasn't changed as much as it needs to change. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we're in this meet two times up era that I think it's ever so important for guys also to step into the conversation. And, and for us as like white guys, like from, I'll just sort of speak for myself here in the States, like I never really found myself in the minority. Mm. And empathy is so critical now to help bring our communities together so we can listen to connect with each other that joining organizations like the Healthcare Business Women's Association or being in situations where you're in the minority so you can feel what it feels like to be in mm. the minority then maybe that helps you show up a little bit differently and ask a better question, and have a better dialogue. Because I do see a lot of guys during this era sort of like, oh God, this is scary. I don't know what I should do. I'll, I, I will, you know, I've heard guys say, well, maybe I shouldn't have one-on-one -on -one, uh, one -on -one meetings with my female direct reports. Maybe I should do it out in the open. What? And, you know, and, and they're never going to mention this in a corporate workshop. Mm. But they're mentioning after maybe a couple glasses of wine, as the guys sort of go off and talk after a dinner party, and the women go off and talk after a dinner party, and and so they just don't know what to do. So what they're doing is sort of retreating from the conversation that we need to have, mm -hmm. because we need to get men involved in the conversation and women involved, and people of all color and all backgrounds and all perspectives, because today's problems demand diversity because they're more challenging than ever before and the world is flat in so many ways because of mm. like how we live now <laughs> and and so for me i think it's important to sort of think through like what does it mean to be a guy you know back in the day i thought the guy was the provider the guy was the dad and i really felt i had to be superman at home and superman at work because I was living through like old sort of old paradigms or mm -hmm. old belief systems. And I was living that way, but I was also pouring a whole bunch of stress inside of me. And like, I like to say that SUV literally and figuratively knocked all that like mojo out of my body <laughs> because I was just pouring it in and pouring it in and I wasn't releasing it because I had no idea how to release it. I didn't. So I was just repressing it. And after a while that just bubbles up and it, that's not a good outcome. So I think today we're, we're living through something that's, I think, spectacular, although it can be frightening because mm. we don't know, we don't know where it's going to go. But I do know is that if we all lean in and have a conversation, what it means to be a man today, how can we work with our female colleagues and not be their rescuers? You know, women don't need to be rescued. You know, sometimes mm. they just, they need to, for us to get out of their own, you know, for us to get out of their way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm. um, but what does it mean to be a, a male ally at work or a sponsor, an advocate, a partner? How do we have better conversations, not only between men and women, but just across the board? I think it's an incredible time. And I think if our generation, you know, sort of like Gen X, maybe some of the younger baby boomers, even the millennials that are coming up, if we can have a better conversation at work, we can change work for future generations. And as I mentioned earlier, if we change how we work together, I feel very confident that we're going to change how we live together because we mm -hmm. are spending so much time at work. Totally. 
I guess, you know, from my perspective, it can be, I can understand why it's tough and confusing for some people, because on the one hand, you're celebrating your masculinity and your, you know, that, that that's an important aspect. But on the other hand, you're also sort of being told, no, we're all equal. There are no, a lot of these gender differences, et cetera, aren't really real. And I, and I think, it, I suppose it's good that we, at the end of the day, as you mentioned, Obi, is it's the, the communication. So when things are a bit messy and a bit tough, you, you, people tend to step back and, and, but you're still having the conversation actually with your, like you say, with your mate or someone else. So we just need to be able to lean in and, and discuss these things. But I do get like how, how these, like you said, these transitory periods can be quite confusing. You've got these Jordan Petersons and you've got these strong voices on, on different ends of the spectrum. And it must be quite confusing to be a youngster, especially I mean, for me, even, I mean, for anybody, I suppose, just to, to navigate all of that. I think it's, yeah, I think it's really, it really is confusing. And if, many of the guys today, they didn't necessarily create the problems of the past, mm. you know, because they weren't, around, they, they weren't around. Mm. But we do have a responsibility to work on making it better. Yeah, so we mm. didn't spill the milk, but you know what, we're responsible for cleaning it up, at least part, part of the way, like, you know, again, not to make it up, like the guy has to do it all, but like, it, like mm. together we do it. Um, mm. Having that responsibility or accountability. And I think it's very possible we can have multiple definitions of what it means to be a guy. Mm. You know, and it, where in the past, there was probably like one dominant view of what it means to be a man. So just into things at this stage, I mean, you, you guys were just you know, hitting the straps and it was going incredibly well. And you also had a family coming and you know, all these things. And, um, but it wasn't always easy during that journey and you actually lost a bit of the balance in your life. Um, and that's kind of when yoga sort of came into this yeah. onto the scene. How did yoga and meditation affect you and help you? So I, um, it was two, how old is Ari? I always do my reference to everything by my children's age. So <laughs> Ari's nearly nine. So it was 10 years ago. So I was trying to fall pregnant with her and um, business was going nuts. We were three years in. And I just remember the doctor going, are you stressed? And I was like, no, I'm fine. Like, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm doing a lot and the business is in. And he was just like, I think you could be stressed. <laughs> and um he's like I know you're really fit and healthy you obviously exercise a lot and I was like he's like I just really feel like you need to find a way to just relax a bit more and I was like okay and so I'd heard so much about yoga obviously we all have and I was like okay, I'm just gonna try it and see how I go and I started going every Sunday I just go once a week and I was like this is kind of nice it's kind of cool and then I just started to go, I actually really enjoy it and then I started to shift more from my general fitness being I'm going to do more yoga than I'm going to do, you know, gym work and started to really, just really, I really fell in love with the practice. Um, and that sort of soon led to meditation um, as well, which sometimes it does, you know, we tend to do yoga in the physical form and then start to realize what it changes, what it does to our mindset and how we can actually start to really slow down our thinking. And, um, and then meditation was probably two years after I started to really start to play with that. But for yoga is a fundamental for me now I think you know I just whilst I still you know go to the gym and run and stuff like that um it's just so important for me to have that quiet time um mm. and I think uh it's totally changed the way that I view mindset and how important our mindset is mm. and I think that I was always somewhat aware of it intuitively but I think that it's really strengthened my praxis in terms of why do I think like that? Okay, that's an interesting observation and being much more self-aware of how I'm feeling and when I'm in alignment and when I'm, when I'm feeling like something's not quite right. And so that started 10, yeah, about 10 years ago uh, and I've had a solid practice since then and I, do, I love it. Like, I really love it. I think hmm. it's, it's, um, it serves me really well. Yeah, yeah, it it's really is, is a game changer, I think, definitely. Yeah. And um, it's, it's good to see that it's like becoming more and more popular, you know, and I wish, uh, I wish more people would actually do it. And especially guys as well, because guys kind of still, 
they kind of still look at it like, oh, that's the thing for the, the ladies to do, you know? And I'm like, yeah. cool, you should come to a class and then maybe you'll yeah, see how different... easy it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So hard. <laughs> it's exactly, it's amazing how many guys I've actually invited and like they've actually left like halfway through because they, I don't know, they just could, couldn't basically handle it's it. too so hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, and, exactly. And I think it's, um, I think people are like, oh, it's just flexibility and mobility. Mm. And I'm like, it's amazing for flexibility and mobility. But if you're in a pose that's super uncomfortable, mm. stay in it. Yeah. And then that's when yeah. I find the mind chat is super interesting. Totally like, is. oh, okay. I'm just, you know, I'm bitching and moaning about this. And then I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, shift your focus. So I think that's what's, that's what's most challenging about yoga is being able yeah. to calm your mind, you know, during the process. It, it is for sure. Yeah. And you know what? Yeah. Also just staying still, like still in inverted commas, like in one place yeah. for like, depending on how yeah. long your practice is, say like an hour, like yeah. that's much more difficult than walking around the gym, going to pick up weights, saying how's it to your buddies. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. It's, there's uh, no it's, distraction. If no. you're on the mat, there's, there is no noise other than your mental noise. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think it's so, that's why I think the transformation is so great through yoga is you're right. You're on that yoga mat for 60 minutes. You're not going anywhere. Yeah. You're not picking up a phone. You're not looking at, you know, changing yeah. the song. Yeah. You know, you're in the moment for the whole time. And that's the power of the practice. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Awesome. And, and I think it builds up a good discipline in you as well, you know, and, and a good strength and stuff. So, so maybe yeah. you can ma tell us a little bit about uh, mind-body connection and, and why, like, it is such an important thing. Yeah, I think that when I was younger, it was always, you know, I grew up obviously with my parents, obviously being, you know, fit and in fitness, knowing that you just had to exercise. Like I was just like, it's, it's good for your body. That's just what you have to do. So it was always being like, that's a given. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, the, my kids always know that too. They're like, I knew you need, need to exercise. And, but I think it wasn't until I started to get a bit older that I was like, actually, it's less about the external output and it's more about what happens for me in my mindset when I exercise and how much better I feel during the day. Not just, it's not just the physical part that I start that I think people, people are like, Oh, you should go for a run or you should go for a walk. It's like, yes, physically you should, but your mind state changes by doing it. And the discipline, the discipline of exercise in itself is, um, is the challenge that we should be all taking on. And I think that people are like, Oh, I can't run. It's like, you can run, you're choosing not to run. <laughs> Everybody can run. And, you know, but it's like, I can't. It's like, well, you don't want to is mm. actually what you're saying. I don't want to run is different to I can't run or mm. I can't do yoga. It's like, well, you can, you don't want to, or you think you, you know what I mean? So I think that yeah. the mindset of, you know, you have to exercise and the discipline to exercise is something that I think people shy away from. It's like, I don't have time. It's like, we're well, not prioritizing it enough. Yeah, yeah and the discipline healthy. of exercise. Yeah, that's very yeah, well said. Discipline is is so important that you know if we can't stick to that, then that f that flows into the rest of our life. It's okay. What other commitments have we made that we're not fulfilling? So exercise to me is you know if you you don't want to go for a run, you still go for a run, and then afterwards you're like, oh, okay, yeah. one, I feel better physically. Two, I've had some mental space. But three, I did something that I know I needed to do, so I overcome a challenge. Hmm. And I think that people. Um, think that they're going to want to go for a run all the time or they're going to, I can't wait to go to the gym. That's not the reality. The reality is I don't actually want to go today, but I'm going to make myself go. So that's a discipline. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I think that, yeah, so we avoid that challenge, but at the end of the day, the challenge is what moves us forward in so many other things as well. Yeah, basically yeah. agree. It's such a, it's actually, there are very few people, even if you are like a real sportsman, a woman, very few people are like actually always excited to get out there. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's days you that say. you're like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And but I I'm think going to do of, it anyway. Yeah. So, cause, cause I, you know, and that's where I think people are expecting to want to do it. Yes. And that's not reality. There's some days you're not going to want to do it, but you still have to do it. And I think, and off the back of that is that most people that, most people that don't exercise will think that the people that are exercising are, are like loving every second of it. Exactly. And then they go, Oh, but they just, they just naturally love it. And, and it's just not the truth. It's not, it's not true. We don't all love doing that. You know, yeah. it's hard. It's, it's work. It's discipline. It's, you know, I, it's sweaty and you have to have a shower yeah. and it takes yeah. up an hour of your day. Like all these things, we've all got the same excuses, but I think at the end of the day, we just don't prioritize enough what it does for us. And I think for me, it's like, as I get older, I'm, I'm, how old am I? 45 now. And I think, you know, I want to be able to run around with my kids. So my priority to keep my fitness 
is that's the focus point. It's not just, I, you know, I'm not 20 anymore focused on how I look, but it's mm -hmm. like, I want to be fit and healthy. I don't want to, you know, I want to be able to be with my kids when, when I'm 60, you know, my youngest is only going to be 20. So um, it's, it's a priority. And, and also like when you used to telling yourself, okay, I'm not that keen, but I'm going to do this. And you feel that reward when other challenges do come along your path that you're not expecting, you suddenly are like, same I've mindset done this before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is like, I don't really want to do that, but it's important. So I'm just, I'm just going to do that. And I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at that. Mm. Um, and it's something that I really try and teach my kids, which is you might not want to do it, but it's the right thing. So let's just get it done. And then afterwards, always like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Or mm. I feel really good. So it's like <laughs> teaching them that you have to push through the challenge. Um, and I think that, I think that, you know, my 19 year old, we talk about it and I'm like, it's not always easy. Mm. You shouldn't expect things to be easy. And if you're trying to do something really well, or you're striving for something that means that you're really pushing yourself, it's going to be hard. Mm. But it doesn't mean that's wrong. People, I think, sometimes are mm. so like, it should be easier. And I'm like, well, look at what you're trying to achieve. Why would that be easy? Yeah. So there's always going to be a challenge, but I think that we sometimes try and avoid it. Like there's the sneaky shortcut to getting there. And, and it's like, there isn't, you have to go mm -hmm. through the challenge to, to achieve what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And it yeah. feels good. On so, so, but did you, were your folks actually uh, divorced or you just, your dad just kind of like, he, he wasn't, he said he obviously wasn't around, but um, you know, and, 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 did this, like you said, it, it affected you, but like how else did it maybe impact you? And, and were there any like siblings or was it just the, you and your mom? Okay. So my mom was married. Um, she was, she was engaged to, to a mining foreman, which in those days was still a very respectful job. And uh, he had an accident uh, in underground and he, he, he became paraplegic as a result. So my mom being the sweetheart that she is decided to go through with the marriage and she married him in hospital. Wow, and wow. Um, yeah, which is, both very cool and also quite foolish if you want to enjoy, you know, any of your life, to be honest. And so it's a, it was a massive sacrifice. So she, could, she couldn't have uh, children. <coughs> and, um, and so they adopted my brother, Mark. Um, and 10 years later, after, as you can imagine, a relatively boring life in, in all aspects, uh, she, she really helped. She picked him up and did everything for him, created this big lawnmower company where she did all the lifting. And he was super wealthy. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> and um, after 10 years of really just sacrificing to this guy who really didn't treat her well, and I met him, and I could say that he has passed on. God rest his soul. There's no dissing, but it, it, he wasn't, wasn't amazing to her. And so my mom, as most people do quite naturally, you know, do drift. And uh, she met my dad, which was a no-brainer. He was an absolute legend. He was like a boxing champion. And he was a proper, proper player and I could see how he would have swept my mom away. And uh, my mom was a, a good looking woman as well, still at that time, you know? And so they had an affair in the marriage and I was the result of the affair. And in those days, if you did commit adultery or ha have an affair, you get to, you, you are kicked out of the marriage with nothing. So she, she got nothing, but she got the step, she got the adopted brother, Mark. And, um, and he left and he left her no money whatsoever. And my dad being the bugger that he was, <laughs> <laughs> also had multiple affairs going on, which my, which my mom wasn't happy with at all. And she would have no part of it. So she literally, I think a year or two of trying to make it work with my dad while I was around, she got, she was over it and she made the call. She was like, that's it. I'm going to raise, raise this child by myself. I don't know most, I don't know the exact details, but I, I know that he was probably, there was a whole nother family that he was kind of with already mm. when he had, when he had um, been with my mother. So in hindsight, I think a fantastic call on my mom's part. Uh, to keep me away from it. And then what happened further down the line is after, like one day when I go back to Johannesburg, kind of in, in Rand Park, end of Rand Park, that question went from, who's that guy with, you know, playing ball with the younger kids? And I was just like, mom, who, who is that guy? My, my guy of those guys. <laughs> who's that tall guy? My guy. Is he even tall? Is he alive? And she was like, oh yeah, here's his number. I was like, you, you are, you are, what are you, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow, dumbstruck, man. Yeah, He's like, yeah. he has his number. I was like, you're kidding me. I've been no telling way. people he's dead. <laughs> not, not, for, not for a long time. Though. I think this is literally a pre-primary, like, little memory that I have, you know? <laughs> I was like, what? He's got it. How can he have a number? He's in heaven. Um, Jeez. <laughs> so, so I just called him up. And uh, I was like 16, 17, I think, 17. I called him up and I said, hey. Yep, dad, it's me, Art, 
And he was like, oh, oh. freaked out. <laughs> Pay phone. He's like, oh, I can't believe it. I was like, maybe we should meet. And he was like, yes, definitely we should meet. So that was in Joburg. And um, we said, okay, we're going to meet next weekend at the Hyperama entrance one and 10 o'clock. I was like, okay, Kev, that's it. That's, I mean, those days, that's how you had to make arrangements. And there were no calendar reminders with push notification. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to the Hyperama, 10 o'clock. Mom couldn't deal with it. She went around the corner, went and did some shopping. And I was like, I just guess I'm looking for an old dude who's looking for a young dude. <laughs> he didn't tell me what it is. <laughs> it's actually quite scary in this day and age that that, that was a thing because anything else could have happened, right? Uh, and um, and shit, I was there at 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock. I was like, ah, oh, bugger. But again, I, there was, I had no anger in me. I, there was nothing. I wasn't, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's, I don't know if there's levels of, of, um, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I didn't feel anything untowards. I was like, curse you, dad. You left me alone at the hypermarket. Wow. My knees like, yeah, it's like, okay, give. So I went back, I went back and I dad, I'm like, bro, what's up, bro? I was at the, I was at the entrance. And he's like, what do you, what do you mean? What you said entrance two. I was like, no, I said entrance one. He's like, ah, he had been oh, standing shit. at the entrance, literally around the corner, as passionately as I had. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he was like, I promise you, I was, there. I was at this entrance. There was the thing. I was like, I know where that one is, but that's not where we said. Anyway, so Kev, I said, let's, <laughs> let's try again. So I said, why don't, we, why don't we find it? Why don't we actually make a place, like a, like a coffee shop or something? He was like, brilliant idea, son. I was like, okay, <laughs> that's, great. that's a great idea. And uh, <clears throat> so it was the next one. Next time we met in Northgate. And... Um, it was a little bit easier. There was just a lowly old guy sitting at one of the tables and I walked up to him. We both just stood up and just started sobbing uncontrollably. It was no just the most beautiful, mm. natural, easy thing. And we just hugged and sobbed and hugged and sobbed some more and hugged and sobbed. And, and it was just beautiful. And um, so we, we started a connection from there. First of all, I milked, I milked quite a few of the missed birthday presents from him. I made him buy me a, a drum kit because <laughs> 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 I was studying drums. <laughs> which he did gladly and he was a legend and then we got to hang out hang out you know subsequently and and spoke a lot of just just about where he was at and where my mom was at and and and, and in all of it i was just like yeah that's that's just how it is that's what the situation was it wasn't great you were wrong she was probably a bit wrong here and there who knows like talking about it really not gonna it's really not gonna help us get to our next brandy and coke so why don't we why don't we speak to the waiter <laughs> Do you know what i mean <laughs> so we had <laughs> So we had a, you know, we had a bunch of cool time. I got to play golf with him. He's an, he's a, he's a absolutely incredible player from the bunker. I've, I've saw, I've saw him hold like three or four bunker shots, which killed me because I've still never no done that in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we just had a cool, <clears throat> unashamed, proper love affair with each other. And then when I moved to the states, we used to, we used to like look at each other in the eyes with tears and go, "Dad, you know I love you, right?" He goes, ah, "You know I love you." I'm like, no, wow. Dad, I, 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 I love you. And it didn't matter where we were, crowded airport, crowded family gathering, crowded anything. And the tears would just stream by those. Do you know I love you? It's like, yes, of course I know I love you. And, I, and that was the last thing I said to him when I, when I found out that he passed away when I was in New York. So I had proper peace about all of it. <clears throat> you know what I mean? So there was just, there's nothing like, oh, I wish I had of, like, no, I, it was, we, we said, we forgave each other in an instant and we confessed <laughs> our love over and over again, something that most people who have been brought up with very caring fathers would die. Do you know what I mean? Like wondering if, wondering more about if, if they'd said mm -hmm. what, what, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. bud. Wow. Oh, that's yeah. uh, such a, such a human, beautiful story, man. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, sure. At 17 though, that's like a real young, tender age really to, to but like, have this peace <laughs> of mind to be like, I'm going to go and do this and call him up. Were you, how were you feeling? Were you super nervous? Were you? Actually, I think what, what happened is um, I remember Glenn Thompson and, and um, oh, was it Ian? Oh, these beautiful boys. That we, we, we're a little bit of a naughty crew. I think we bunked, we bunked school one day, probably got stoned. I think we were trying to get into weed at that stage. I'm not too sure. Um, <clears throat> I really can't remember. So we may have been stoned or may have not been. And I remember uh, may have us <laughs> being on a mission. Glenn was like, that's it. We're walking now. We're going to go and find your father. I was like, okay. It, wow. It's Joburg. Like, but where, which way do you want to? Cause we used to hitch everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, was a, you want to walk and you're going to look at, you don't know what he looks like. I don't know nice. what he looks like, but we're going to go and find, it was one of those missions. So <clears throat> it's likely that there was some green involved. <laughs> and then I, and I was like, I was like, hang on. I've got, I've got, a, I've got a clue. What if I ask my mom 
where he yeah. might be. And they were like, yes, that's genius. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, mom, where's dad? And she's like, he has his number. I was like, oh. <laughs> no way. They've taken all the walking out of it. <laughs> no, <I'll bet. laughs> So, 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 but I mean, it sounds like there wasn't too, well, there was reconciliation, but there wasn't almost anything to sort out, like in terms of you and your dad, was it all like that? And then what was your mom's kind of reaction to this new relationship forming? Uh, no, she was, she was supportive of it, but she wanted nothing to do because he was still with the family that he had on the side, which caused her obviously immense pain. <clears throat> do you know what I mean? <clears throat> That's her stuff. Yeah. So she was happy that I had the relationship, but she wanted nothing to do with integrating anything like that. So mm-hmm. she was, she was very brave um, to be part of as much of it as she did, to be honest, because there was a lot of, there was a lot of trauma around, around that, her reasoning for, for, for running away from me, which I still haven't ever asked all the full details, but I, I probably could mm. just not. Some- It almost sounds like you, you're almost more in like winemaking and it will like, you know, you, you're not just set and forget it's, it's you, you, you're involved the whole time. You, every step of the way you, you quality control and yeah, it's, it's a massive feat. And I was just wondering in terms of the, uh, the preservatives, if you can make food without preservatives, right? Um, like you guys are doing, why yes. is it so prevalent? It does it, does it lengthen like the time that you can have it on the shelf or, or what is the actual yeah. purpose of it? Tony, so, so, okay. So our food is all frozen. So just, just to, to clarify as well, our food all comes frozen. So, so we're a frozen food brand because if you're going to have no preservatives, you're going to have to sort of preserve that food somehow. Now mm. it is by far the best way to preserve things. I mean, like you see how they pull out woolly mammoths out of, out of the uh, ground, you know, in snow, I've been frozen for like many, 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 many years. Um, and um, freezing is, 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 is nature's most sort of efficient way of, of sort of like storing things. But now the, the way to achieve the quality there is actually fast freezing, so blast freezing, so we can get them down to like low temperatures within literally sort of minutes, you know, sometimes. So that's the whole thing. Now, why the others are using a lot of preservatives um, is like for two reasons. One is obviously to preserve the, the uh, shelf life, so you get what your food. I want it to last, it's got to last like, for instance, 12 months or it's got to last so many months, I mean, because they will freeze it sometimes as well with preservatives, or it's a product that's got to go on the shelves, or you'll have a jam or a sauce where you know preservatives in the sauce because the preservatives will keep it um, fresh and looking bright and clean and, and colorful without, mm-hmm. anything. you know, um, it'll sit in the shelf, it'll look nice. Um, but the problem actually is also when you open it up, you take a spoon and you take that spoon and you take a lick and you put the spoon back into the actual, um, you know, sort of sauce. <laughs> It goes to live and it goes back in there. So preservatives do have a role to play in that there. Um, mm. And I think that there probably is a good time to, to use them. I mean, I, originally I was like, no preservatives at all. Never, ever had preservatives. But I, now I'm like in a case case. Like for our brand, we will never use preservatives. But I think that there are times in life where you need something to be yeah. and, and And like, also, so don't be an idiot about it and say, let's ban everything. I think how do you use them sort of in a, in a, in a, in a more logical and... Um, yeah, clever way. Like for instance, okay, so there's a thing called the law of Paracelsus. So there's a guy, the father of toxicology, Paracelsus, he came up with a, a, a rule many years back and he said, um, it's the dose that matters. So basically mm-hmm. what he's saying is that like everything is poisonous, it's the dose that matters. So literally, if you have too much water, it can become dangerous for you. If you have too much oxygen, it becomes dangerous for you. Whatever you have in life, um, it becomes dangerous. Now, the thing with, with preserving are preservatives bad for you in small doses? I'd probably say I tested and, and probably they're completely fine for you in small doses. The issue is everyone uses the preservatives and the additives, mm-hmm. the colorants and the flavorants nowadays. You have got no more control over sort of how much of those um, additives and preservatives you're getting. So if the law is that everything is poisonous, it's the dose that matters, but you can't control the dose of something that you're getting, then actually mm-hmm. sort of like say abstain. I, I want to control my life. I want to control my quality of my food. And it's all about quality. Let's leave the preservatives out. And like once in a while when I do have them or I'm drinking water and there's preservatives or I put face cream on my face and there's something in there that does something, mm-hmm. rather be a bit stricter. So in the modern world, I think we need a yard. So, so, so preservatives have their place, I would say, but, but they're overused. They are absolutely abused mm-hmm. by the, the um, commercial food industries. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So, so while we're talking about it, like, People don't necessarily 
know how bad certain foods are and, and things are uh, in, within the food and that kind of thing. So maybe you can just give us some sort of an indication, uh, maybe without totally scaring us, um, if that's possible. <laughs> well, I mean, if, so for instance, like one of the big things I'm really sort of like um, watching at the moment is your, your gut biome. And I won't go into the gut biome now, but just to mention, so we all know that your gut is really important. The, the bacteria that live in your gut basin sort of run your whole body. I mean, the reason you digest and the reason a lot of your body functions work is because of all these bacteria that live in your mouth, on your skin, in any sort of like premise you've got in your body, there is bacteria that is very, very, very beneficial. A real sort of symbiotic relationship. Now, if your gut bacteria is out, uh, we're seeing links to everything from autism, autoimmune diseases, um, uh, I mean, cancers, migraines, um, everything, I mean, everything out there, you know, Alzheimer's, the whole duty. Um, now, the problem is, like, we've been told, for instance, like, like something as simple as, like, the whole movement to say, no sugar added. Or, and what they do is they, they then go and add three types of artificial sugars. Now, in a lab, when they want to shut down your um, microbiome in your stomach, they want to flatten your bacteria in, in your gut, they are literally using, um, um, with, with rats and with other things as well, they are using um, artificial sugars huh. to shut down and, and damage your gut bacteria so they can reset you and see how you react. Now, this is something we told about, you know, by everyone, it's totally fine to use, you know, the xylitols and the whatever else, um, the erythritols, sucralose and all those things. It's not <laughs> because actually uh, the damage that it's causing, we, we are not, we, we cannot think in terms of, you know, proteins, carbs, sugars and fiber anymore and fats. You know, you've got to think that food is not just like those little, you know, four or five little things and a, and a bit of vitamins and minerals. I mean, that's getting mm. deep. You're looking at sort of like, like code. There's code. There's, I mean, you've got toxins in there. You've got things that, things in there that can make you sort of like completely high. There's things in food that obviously we know make you high. There's food that make you low. There's foods that affect your emotions. Food is code into your body. And the reason is it's affecting your gut biome. So even something as simple as, it's okay to use artificial sugars because sugar is worse for you. When they found that, when they done tests um, for um, 11 days, they did tests at two different groups, one group with um, normal sugar added uh, uh, and one group with, with all the artificial sugars, they found the group with the artificial sugars had much higher blood sugar than the other groups. So, you know, mm. you just can't trust what's going on, I believe. Yes, You've got to back to nature. Yeah, yeah, nature. Yeah, yeah, it's super scary, man. Like, you know, and, and like you said, the, the issue is, is that it's in everything. That's, that's the actual problem, you know, so you, you, you can't avoid it. Well, you know, you can totally avoid it, but like, you know, people want the kind of ease of just kind of buying, you know, buying stuff and then making their life as easy as possible to cook and whatnot. And, and when you do that, it's in everything. So there's no, there's no like rest from these things. You're constantly mm. putting your body, like, you know, this stuff in your body and, and that's the issue, you know, so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you're like, like, like you're only finding out 20 years later or whatever that this was the cause. I mean, yeah. like, you know, I mean, uh, oh, it's ridiculous, you know. So I rather just, just trust, trust nature. Like, don't be a hippie, but trust nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally, but totally, man. And um, like, tell us maybe about some of the success stories that you've had with Fitchev, because there's been some incredible, oh. you know, changes in people. Moments. Yeah. So, so actually, um, I mean, we've had. Just on a staff level, I mean, like, you know, so originally we, you know, we, we grew incredibly fast. I mean, like, you know, like the first three years, we just doubled in size. And every day you needed a bigger, more trucks, more, more staff, more people. And we, we kind of just said, like, if you could start work tomorrow and you were available and you could work a computer, just, just arrive and we'll hire you. So we had a lot of people <laughs> who, were, who were pretty sort of like overweight and um, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases and, and, and issues. So we had staff arriving and literally losing 40 kilograms. They, they come on board. Um, it really felt like I remember sort of dealing with something thinking, my goodness, these people are not conscious at all. They're, they're, they're just like, they arrived at work, they're super overweight, very unhappy, um, autoimmune diseases for the last like 30 years kind of in their lives. And the, they come on board, drop those 40 kilograms. I would see this massive change happening in their consciousness. I should have worried about some of them at one point. I'll be like, I've seen such a massive change in their thinking style. But I'm actually worried about sort of how they communicate with their existing friends and the existing mm -hmm. family because, or their circles, because I mean, there's been such a mental change. Then the physical change, I mean, you know, we have people who, who had, um, 
I mean, horrific autoimmune diseases that are a one PR agent. And uh, she had lupus. 22 years living on like literally a handful of tablets every morning. Uh, she's on our food uh, for um, three months. Also did a bit of work um, emotionally as well. And literally uh, in three separate um, tests, the doctor was like, I've never seen this before. Where has the lupus gone? Like, I have not seen this. It must be a broken test. Sent again. Have another test. And eventually said, okay, something's wrong with this lab. I'll send you to another lab. And there was no signs of lupus. And, and, and we get this all the time. We get you know, so you basically, you're, you're, you're in America, you're setting up your business, um, and then tragedy strikes, actually. And it's, uh, it, it, it's just through a, um, an, a game of touch rugby, basically, you know, that you're probably playing every single afternoon. So mm. can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, I started for pretty much for um, community and, and uh, stress release. I started playing um, touch rugby on the beach with the, the boys down in Santa Monica. And I was playing with them, you know, two, three times a week uh, for years. And I was not new to the game. I grew up playing it and loved it. And yeah, this one casual Sunday, um, I don't know, this guy maybe just caught the ball in such a fashion that he thought he was on the pitch in Eden Park against the All Blacks <laughs> and saw me as, I don't know, a, a target to take down. I don't know. I, it, it's such a freak thing because, you know, no one really hears about someone having such a, uh, ending up with such an injury from a touch rugby game. Um, but anyway, he, he ran into me and knock me into next week and I I landed pretty heavily the boys were like all we saw was your feet up in the air and on the back of my head and the ricochet effect um from oh, like serious whiplash I guess um ended up causing frontal lobe hippocampus and amygdala uh damage and I ended up I lost memory, cognitive speech, like taste, smell, um, vision problems, uh, emotional problems, a lot of pain. It was kind of like fire ants were in my head trying to get out all the time. And I mean, if you can think about any injury you have, like even knee or ankle, when that inflammation there is there, it's, it's, so, um, it, it's so painful. So in your head that, you know, controls everything, your computer, so everything just sort of switched off. Um, no appetite, no, no triggers to drink water, to eat, to, to do anything. So it was, uh, I didn't know what country I was in. I didn't know why I was here or what I was doing. Um, I was a real life Dory. My memory was a, a couple of minutes. No ways. Oh, wow. Mm. Wow. That's crazy. How, how long did that sort of carry on for? Um, the worst of it was probably a good nine to 12 months. Um, what? Yeah. And I would say you know, almost full recovery. There's things that I may never get back and I just deal with now. <clears throat> it was at least two years. Yeah. Wow. And, and so like, they must have been so shocked because did, did you have symptoms like almost straight away? Like when you were lying there or, or um, did they sort of... Did the boy said I stood up and made a joke. Uh, I don't remember, but it sounds like me. So that's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> just, still uh, following through on my comedy. So that's good. Um, <laughs> But I do remember it was a couple of hours later and we usually go for lunch after and uh, sitting there with everyone and everything just became blurry. I started to feel like I was going to throw up. I, I felt very confused and felt like everyone was speaking another language that I couldn't understand. And, wow. you know, I uh, just was like, I, and, and this is comes down to awareness thing, especially for women. We're not really educated on like a concussion like that. Like especially men playing contact sports, you guys are a lot more aware. So you would be able to go, oh, hey, I got hit like this. I got this. I probably have a concussion. I should do X. For me, I was like, I must be dehydrated and hormonal. Um, I'll go home and mm. go to bed. Oh, and no way. I knew enough about them, but not for it to happen to me. It hadn't happened to me like that before. So mm. I went home and I went to bed and um, super lucky, woke up next day. Mm. And one of the guys that had been on the um, uh, playing in the game with me the day before was coming around to uh, pre-organize to help me with some work and a delivery. And he said that he turned up and he said, I was walking around in circles. I was not making sense. I was dropping things. I was really agitated. 
I was repeating myself or you said you were, I was so confused and he's like I think that you have a, have a concussion and uh, from there just uh, followed up with uh, friends that were doctors because I didn't have insurance and mm. they checked in on me to make sure you know no bleed on the brain that kind of thing and because you know it's a bit of a joke over here for uh, us uh, immigrants, I guess. Don't send me to the hospital. No doctor. I don't care if my legs cut off, put me on a plane and send me back to Australia. It would be cheaper. So um, <laughs> didn't go to the doctor. And um, and when my friends like visited, they're like, okay, so it's quite bad. Um, but typically, you know, you have to wait a few months to see if it gets better, what it's going to do. And then three months later, I went to a proper doctor in, in an office and uh, he did all the tests and he's like, yeah, it's it's a big one. It's probably going to be about two years for recovery. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. You, you know, what? I don't think uh, you, you mentioned men knowing about concussion a bit more, but actually it's actually quite shocking. Even doctors and stuff, there's a way too little known about concussion mm. and awareness. It's, it's getting better slowly, but surely. But um, on the, on the, on the field side, I still hear it all the time. Like youngsters have a big knock and the, the coaches are still like, Oh yeah. Um, you know, two weeks or one week off and it's not enough. Like people, and, and also the thing that people don't realize is that it doesn't always have, to, you don't always have to have massive amount of symptoms to have had a concussion. Like yours must've been really bad, obviously, but um, you know, it's a massive thing that people need to be understanding more because it can happen from touch rugby. It's not all, you know, rugby games and it, it can be other things. And so I'm glad that you bring this up because it's, it's, um, it's actually very important for, for parents and for coaches and things like that to have some understanding of because it's that serious, you know. If yeah. you take a second knock, it's really bad. Mm, yeah, exactly. and, and Craig, there's actually, I don't know if you've seen the movie, uh, but it's with uh, Will Smith. Oh, I love that movie. I think, what is it called concussion or is it called? I think it is. Yeah, and it's about American football and yeah. basically. The South African doctor? Yes, you, oh no, was he South yeah. African? Yeah, yeah, or, or Nigerian, I can't remember. But, um, but yeah, basically, I guess what happens is these guys are playing American football and they have clashes of the head all the time, not just in, in matches, but during training. And um, the long-term effects of it are like serious, serious, um, you know, like a like mix of serious issues. Um, I think they call it uh, CTE, where they're having so these. Um, it's got a big long name. People can Google it. Um, I'm not going to say it, um, but it is having the long-term effects that since that movie, uh, which I don't think the NFL wanted it to come out, no. um, more and more people, more and more guys and even wives are, that have divorced husbands have come forward sort of talking about what they've gone through after from these repeated head, head injuries without any support or a break for recovery and what you mentioned before about the awareness about it and it's only since I've been through it is uh gosh how how more common it is than um than anyone's like talking about and that I think it's difficult because every single person is different and so every everyone that I met there's and like we've said before there's no one way to treat anything but there's not there's almost no two people that have the same um exact same uh, problems after a concussion. They're like varying depending on what you had going on before or like the kind of person you are or, what, or where it hits or where it's damaging. And so it's really, really hard to um, just give one protocol for a head That's injury. It's mm. crazy. I actually had a patient that was playing tennis and she, had a, and she got hit by the tennis ball and it was a serious concussion. And like, wow. you know, there's another example. You, you, it's not in the you're not in this environment that you would expect. So you don't think it's concussion initially, which is, which is pretty crazy. And, and actually talking about that, Gareth, what you, that movie and stuff, like people are actually saying that the whole CTE story, uh, Lonnie is like, um, almost as bad as smoking was because in some ways people are covering it up. They don't really want to accept that this is actually a reality. And, and, uh, so people are suppressing this information like big time because, uh, yeah, but it's which is pretty crazy. But um, it, down the track, they they reckon with you know the depression rates and all that that comes from these sportsmen and women, um, it will eventually become apparent how how it was suppressed, you know, for a long time because the clubs don't want it. Um, but yeah, so. It's 
and then they did the first dialysis. And I was so I, I was so aware of the fact that the first ever time I did dialysis, I'd had that mild stroke and it had gone really badly. That mm -hmm. I thought, okay, it's ten years, ten years now since no more, um, more that I've had a problem. How is my body going to react to this dialysis? You know, mm -hmm. so I was just saying my family's name. Uh, each of their names in my head so that I wouldn't lose focus. So I was <laughs> sitting there going, Di Di Diane, Maggie, Freddie, Benjamin. Benjamin, Freddie, Maggie, Diane, back and forth in my head so that I could just stay with the process. And I did that for three hours. What? Until, until the dialysis was, was finished. And then it was the most amazing thing they finished and they said, just close your eyes a little bit and have a nap. And I, and I, and I, and I closed my eyes a little bit and then I woke up and one of our friends was in the room, was in, the, was in there, who she happens to work at the hospital, good friends of mine and Diane. And just seeing someone that you know mm. uh, was, was huge. I was like, okay, it's going to be fine. And that was kind of like, then I knew I'd be okay. And then, yeah, we still had a couple of hiccups along the way. My platelet count from that point went up very quickly, but then it dropped back down really badly. So at one stage it went up to around 200 and... 80,000 I think it was and then over a weekend it dropped to 4,000 hmm, and then kind of like restart again you know and um, and then that was all going okay and and you know I was able to like whatsapp people and talk to people and and my attitude in the hospital was just I'd read that Bruce Lipton book The Biology of Belief and my attitude was just just stay happy just mm -hmm. stay happy so um, this is where I must say to you guys um I listen to your guys' podcast all the time and because it's just such a happy, you guys create such a happy podcast, such a, your conversations are always so happy and, and it was so positive. And so when I do my walks in the mornings in the, in the passageway, I'd listen to you guys and <laughs> I say, thank you so much because it was one of the things that helped me stay positive when it was, would have been really easy to, to get down and negative. And um, so it was awesome. Um, and uh, so you know, my thing was just stay positive and pump, your body was full of those po that positive energy and, and those positive things in your blood. And, and, and so I'd be friendly to everyone and make my, my, I would, um, I started journaling and I was like, okay, so I'm going to do a write it forward journal. So I would write in the evening, I'd write down what's going to happen tomorrow. And it would be like dialysis is going to go well. Uh, you're going to be friendly to everybody. You're going to be patient. You're not going to. You're not going to be. Um, you're not going to get impatient with anybody. Um, you. You. You know. You're going to make five people laugh, and you're going to make ten people smile, and you're going to. And you know, there was all these kind of things that I was like, I'm just going to try to be as positive and happy and friendly as I can because that's going to help me get through this thing. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, that's what I did. And then, um, and then I contracted a bacterial infection from a guy in the hospital and, uh, and it was, it was quite hectic. I was supposed to go home, uh, for, for a night uh, and two days because they were like, listen, it'll be good for you to go home and spend a bit of time with your family and then come back and we'll see how you respond, um, mm. how your blood count is and everything. And then, uh, that it was supposed to be the Saturday that I was going to go home and the Friday night I did a dialysis treatment. It didn't go well. I was really uncomfortable. I was very hot and feverish and didn't feel good. And it took a long time. And then that night um, at about probably around, it was actually early in, in the morning, probably at one o'clock in the morning, I started getting cold shivers and, um, and, and, and sweating. And, and that lasted about 20 minutes. And I thought to myself, do I need to call a nurse? But then it went away. So I thought, okay, now I'm fine. And then the next morning at about six-ish, one of the nurses came to check my temperature. And my temperature was at 39.8 <laughs> degrees Celsius. And she's like, this is really high. And uh, I'm worried about this. And then I had like another shaking, cold fever, cold shakes and everything. But this time it was really bad. I was like, I couldn't stop shaking. Um, they had to give me an oxygen mask because I was battling to breathe. Um, and then what happened was they said to me, um, you we're going to take you to ICU because the machines are better and it's just a precaution. You've got a bacterial infection, but it's just a precaution. Hmm. I phoned Diane and I said, listen, I'm, I'm not coming home, um, but they're sending me to ICU, but it's just a precaution that the machines are better. The hospital phoned Diane, told her the same thing. Hmm. And then um, 24 hours later, I was in a coma um, because they had to induce, induce, because the only thing they could do with this bacterial infection was heavily, heavily sedate me. And uh, then it was kind of up to me to to pull out 
of the coma. And so then I was in the ICU for about a month. Um, and that was quite a hectic, that was quite hectic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good Lord. And it was the touch and go. Like it literally, you know, yeah. there was, there was moments where we were like, we're not too sure what's going to happen if he's going to make it. Yeah. I mean, there was five days where I was just under and no one knew when I was going to wake up. So yes. yeah, you know, that was, that was, it was, a, it was five days after that I, that I, that I came through. Cause basically what the doctors said to my family was he's, he's under now and it's up to him to come out, to wake up. Jeez. And, and so obviously I don't remember being under and, and, mm. Like this, this mark on my face is from is is apparently from um, tubes that I had in my nose, and then they had pipes down my throat. And because it was hot, uh, it actually burnt me on my because they had to lie me down. They had to lie me down on my on my stomach, and they had to change me all the time so the fluids in my lungs wouldn't mm. stay in one place and it would move around. Um, and yeah, so it was quite a. I don't remember too much. Um, I had, I hallucinated a lot. So like one time I, I, I dreamt or hallucinated that we were being attacked, that the hospital was being attacked by monkeys and wow. these kind of things happened. And there was one stage where I was basically having deja vu and everything was just repeating itself. So my oh, sisters wow. had visits, had come to visit from London and, um, they just kept walking in and I'd have the same conversation and one of them would walk out and the other one would walk in and then no the same one would walk in again and eventually i still remember i i, I had this little chalkboard that i could write stuff on so because i couldn't talk because i had these pipes down my throat and i had to write on this board if i wanted something if i needed to communicate something to the nurses and my sister alshandra um I, I, you know this was after like obviously this this there was no repetition it, it was just in my mind mm. and uh it's it's crazy and and i wrote down deja vu on the, <laughs> and i showed alshandra and she couldn't he, she couldn't read my handwriting and, <laughs> and then she could read it and then i tried it again and i wrote it and she could read it but she didn't know what deja vu was <laughs> <laughs> so she walked out of the room to to my folks and stuff and she was like i'm really confused i don't know what he was trying to tell me and, uh, so yeah a couple of uh, you know it's good to look back and laugh at it now yes. and there was a stage where one of the, 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 the one of the main directors at the hospital got involved as well in terms of it, she was the one who was like, listen, he's got a re he's got this bacterial infection. We need to get him to ICU. And if it wasn't for her, who knows what would happen? If they'd yes. let me go home, Jesus, I don't even want to know because I still said to the guy, so I've got a bit of a fever. You know, that's not going to going home is not going to do any harm. Hmm. And he's like, no, we can't let you go home. Thank God they didn't let me go home because who yeah. knows what would have happened. Um, but but even one of the things in ICU, uh, in the bed next to me, the guy died, and um, and they wheeled him out into the hallway and, and covered him and everything. And she came to visit me, and she saw this body lying in the hallway, and, oh. she, and she thought it was me, and oh, she started no. she started crying and everything. Oh, and uh, so yeah, these God. things happen. So it, but but you know when that happens, it kind of puts everything into perspective, and you're like, okay, it could still be worse, you know, and. Uh, oh. Obviously, you um, found your career or you went into your career kind of, I guess, straight after school and like you're quite young when you started, uh, started studying it. Um, and now you've obviously shifted on. You, you're a coach and you do you know, a few other things as well. Um, what are your thoughts, right, on what age we should sort of be choosing our profession? Here's the thing. When I, when I hear the word age, I think there's, well, there's a chronological age. And then there's like this mental slash intellectual age and the two of them, there's no correlation. Mm. Right. And as soon as we start to think about age at which we should be doing something in terms of chronological age, that's where you can set yourself up for a lot of suffering and a lot of uh, pain and, and a lot of regret. Right. Because the moment that certain key things happen in one person's life compared to another person's life, it's going to be completely different. Mm. Right. And who's to say that you have to have all your ducks in a row at this chronological age? Right. And who's to say that you have to have it all figured out when you are blank years old? And who's to say that anyone has it figured out at all? <laughs> right. <Good> <laughs> right. With the with the with the with the pace of change in today's world, 
the working world, the marketplace, all these industries, things are constantly changing. So you have it figured out now, one year later, all of a sudden you have to figure it out all hmm. over again. Mm. Right. So to say that you have to pick your profession at a certain age is kind of like setting yourself up for disappointment because you can't possibly do that. And, and nowadays, careers are not 20, 30, 40 year tunnels. Yeah. No, professions are not that way. Right. Mm. So then when even if you pick something and you go all in with it, which is what you should do, if you pick something, you go all in all in and then one year later two years later you decide you know that's not quite what aligns with me i'm going to change it up here or i'm going to tweak that or i'm going to completely go a different path it doesn't mean you failed at picking a, a profession mm. yeah. right yeah. as long as you have a rationale for why you're changing course as long mm. as you have that rationale and you can vocalize it and you can communicate it it doesn't mean that you failed. It doesn't mean that at all. It can be one of your most, most valued successes that you changed direction that totally. you did. Yeah. Instead of saying, I'm choosing to be an engineer and this better be my career for the rest of my life. Rather than locking oneself in like that, it's more about keeping an open mind about what are my blind spots? I'm picking this today and I'm going to go all on this today, but every day, every week, every month, I'm always going to be constantly evaluating. What can I do better? What are my blind spots? That's so, the approach. So how do you, how do you help people then to, to understand or, or just to kind of build up uh, the courage to actually um, deal with this change and, and have this adaptability? Because most people say they want to do things they don't do it. But the reason they don't do it is because I guess it's fearful, you know, fearful of, of maybe failure or what other people might think. What, uh, what do you say to people when they say that to you? Yeah. I say that it's because we're trained in, like we are trained as a society to always focus on the strategies and tactics, right? We're, we're always trained to think about, okay, what am I going to do next? Mm -hmm. and what am I going to do? And what are the strategies to get there? I'm not, I don't have what I want right now, but I want to have this. So what do I got to do? What are the strategies to get to have that? Right. And what they're forgetting is that you can't have unless you're, you, you become, you, know, you got to mm -hmm. be, you got to become who you need to be in order to have the ability to do what you need to do. And then you can have Right. So I always say you got to start with what I call internal positioning. We're always so worried about how we position ourselves out there, how we're going to position to ourselves to potential employers, how we're going to position to ourselves to collaborators, to people mm. who might have a real influence on our professional future. But we forget that before we can position ourselves externally, we have to position ourselves internally. And mm. when we have a strong inner game, that's mm. where things get powerful out there because we're becoming, we are focusing on becoming. I mean, who is it? I think it was Oprah who said that, you know, the, some of the most successful entrepreneurs and business owners out there, some of those multimillionaires, the, the, the most successful people out there, they spend 80% of the time working on who they are. Mm. Right. So it's the who that's more important than the, what I do and what I'm going to do. Yeah. So, so you're implying like personal development, uh, getting to know yourself uh, inside out, you know, th this kind of stuff is, is that, is that kind of what you mean? So um, that's part, part and parcel of it. Personal development is part of it, but it's this whole bigger umbrella of an inner game, sort of like a EQ, mm -hmm. right? An emotional quotient. There's a mindset to it as well. There's that, there's the knowing and having a, a high degree of self-awareness. Right. And therefore knowing that there's a choice to everything, mm -hmm. especially how you respond to situations that come your way. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And, and so many people like, this is what I find like I, the, for me, the, and Craig, we talk about this a lot is like the, there's a lack of self-awareness, like in, in so much of like what, what people do, how they talk to, to others, how they, uh, how they behave. Um, just, just, there's just a lack of it. You know what I mean? And, um, but, but, but what, what advice do you have for people, I guess, to, to sort of have more self-awareness? Because it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, you basically, it's your own journey. You need to realize that you need to sort of find out more about yourself. But like, you know, 
do you have any kind of advice or whatever to people to, to sort of start that off? Yeah, I actually, I love questions like that. I really do. Because this is what I live for is to help people to expand and to grow and to expand that into living lives of fulfillment, right? And so self-awareness is a really tricky thing because there's like these, there's four pockets of what we can know of knowledge out there, right? There's things that you know that you know, right? Mm -hmm. There's things that you know you don't know. There's things that you don't know you don't know. And the fourth one is the most dangerous, is, is the scary one. There are things that are just unknowable, mm -hmm. right? And so having a high self-awareness to me means you know the boundaries of where your knowledge begins and where it ends. So you're able to have clarity. You're able to ask the right questions to know, is there something that I don't know that I don't know? possibly mm -hmm. or is there something is it possible that there, there are there are things that i know i don't know and are there things that i think i know but i actually don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> right? so one of the most dangerous things is those people who say oh i know i know and so therefore they close themselves off from further learning further development because they say i know that already yeah right? so the self-awareness comes from having that uh, I can't think of the word. It's not humility. I kind of wanted to, to, to reach for the word humility. It's not really humility. I, I guess it is in the sense that you're saying that, well, there's so much I don't know. But it's more like, um, it's more like this, uh, this holistic, yeah, a holistic perspective where there's so much that you don't know and can't know, but it's okay mm -hmm. because it's better actually to not know and ask the right questions mm -hmm. than to think you know and to stop it at that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. When, you've got, when you've got a big... Yeah, there yeah. was a... Talking about um, good records as well, Gareth, you know, like when, when I lived in Holland, there were a lot of studies with famine because the Dutch had such good uh, records what they did was during the second world war and stuff, when, the, when parts of the country in, in the Netherlands didn't have any food, then they looked at how that had, has affected two or three generations um, hence. Uh, and it's quite amazing to see how you can track the people with obesity or these genes that have it now that were based on the people that had this gene or that were uh, subjected to famine. And because the records were so good at white, height, weight, all these detailed things, um, that's why it's once again good to know these things because you can sort of change uh, or affect those things. And down the track with CRISPR and all these things, who knows what all bets are going to be off, you know? Well, I interviewed the woman who, who started CRISPR. For, for some reason, her name escapes wow. me now, but what an interesting human being that is. And of course, she then, you know, kind of had to sell the technology on and she had a company that didn't do so well in the, in the immediate wake of that. Sometimes the people who discover something are not the ones who actually make it a success. But the, the idea of being able to, to send in a, a piece of code as a marker and to be able to remove some and put some more in, this is, this is the future of, of medicine. And I think everyone is aware of that. Whether we've currently got the capability to actually get there is mm. still a matter of some debate in the scientific community. But this is what's interesting about being alive now. And I think we are the luckiest people that have ever lived. Mm. Uh, and obviously mm. there are probably generations in the future who will, who will look back on us and go, God, those poor things, they were suffering so horribly. <laughs> they had no idea of what the world really was about. And they, they seem so primitive, just like we look at, at past generations and, mm. and we judge them quite harshly. But we are living in a great time. There's, there's less famine. There's less pollution. There's less, I mean, we, there's more forestation happening at the, at the moment than has happened in, in two or 300 years. And I saw the UN report come out the other day. Um, I was astounded by this, that apparently by 2030, and the UN are not well known for sending out signals of optimism. <laughs> they said by 2030, there will not be a single person in the world who will be living under the current poverty line. Uh -huh. So the poorest, <laughs> poorest people right now, $3.70 a day or whatever it is, um, within the next 10 years, there will be no one living that poorly in the world. Sure, so that's, incredible. that's great news. Generally, we're on a very nice upward trend. You know, human progress is a, is a very powerful thing. And we don't stop to take note of that because we're so busy looking at the bad news of the day and 
what Thank what's you. going on right now that is a threat to us and you know free speech and existentialism and political shenanigans and the vagaries of a currency for example these things are all going to matter less and less in the big picture of history um, and we're going to look back and and say that this was a very good time for humans yeah totally I agree people uh, people do love to focus on those negatives and feel like it's you know what about gender all these things but like you say our, our general comfort levels are pretty darn good compared to how they used to be <laughs> but no, um, and, and Gareth, I mean, that's just that's just top level comfort but for for ordinary people there's less conflict than there's ever been in the world yes exactly i mean your your chances of dying violently as a as a male are so reduced that it's actually a rarity for someone to die violently and that's why it ends up in the news so we watch the news and we see that there were you know 300 murders in the african continent today and we go, oh my God, that's awful. That's got to be, it's getting worse and worse. But actually, compared to the 3,000 murders a day that were happening in Rwanda and Burundi during that conflict, or in the DRC during the time of Leopold, where there were potentially hundreds of thousands of people killed in any given week, um, we really are very, very much more fortunate than any of our ancestors. Yeah, and, and you know what, Garrett? Like, it, it's so it's so great. Like, speaking to someone like you because you've you've made an effort, right, to understand history, and I think that's so important. And and what lots of people miss out on is like they they kind of just living in like this kind of blasé kind of way, and they don't actually make that effort to understand what it was like in the world back in the day. Because as soon as you start realizing what it was like. You're like, actually, you know what, like, I'm actually pretty lucky, like, like you said. Well, this is it. I, I, you know, people used to shit where they ate. They used, to, they used to, to eat horrible things. I mean, most of what they ate was raw, and it wasn't because they were on a keto diet. It was because they, they didn't <laughs> yeah. have access to anything else. Um, you, you, would, you would really suffer from morning till night. It was survival mode. There was no such thing as, as being able to engage in this meaningful discussion or debate there was no such thing as, as therapy there was no way for you to try and figure out the purpose of life and and those things that were being discovered by brave pioneers and by people who were way ahead of their time like newton and, and mm. uh, descartes and these sorts of people to me if you don't study what they were going through with an eye to the context of their times you have no appreciation for where you are it's that old idea of the fish, uh, the old fish swimming in the tank. And he says to the, the next generation of fish, how's the water? And they go, what water? Because <laughs> they don't even appreciate that that's what they're living in. You know, we, yeah. we have a, a generation of, of young people, particularly in the first world now, who have grown up with such a degree of ungratefulness for where they're at, thanks to democracy and liberty and, and freedom and, uh, and, and the ability to express yourself and, and the access to the internet. We've got a generation of people who've grown up thinking all of that has always been there. And they have no appreciation for these very, very massive strides. And, you know, I think it was Newton who said, I stand on the shoulders of giants when he wrote his treatise on, on mathematics. Hmm. This is what we have no appreciation for how everyone has toiled and suffered before us from that first caveman who managed to make a spark of fire through all of the, the, the incredible and complex stories of human history to get to where we are now. And for people to, to be complaining right now about, you know, not this, someone's not woke enough or yeah, we, yeah. Don't have, we don't have enough safe spaces is just, it is, it is ungrateful in the extreme, which is why it annoys me so enormously to hear people like that talking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And even our, our memories are even very short because second world war is not that long ago. Mm. And even that feels to me like a distant thing that's, that you yeah. can't really relate to it. So it's very hard for people to, to go back two, three, four hundred years and, uh, and kind well, of get that, that idea. You bring up world war two and, and I've, I, I thought maybe if I didn't do what I'm doing, the next best thing for me would have been to be a history teacher because I do love it that much. And if you don't learn about your past, you're bound to have some, some mistakes committed in the future, which you could avoid. But to go to world war two here, both of my grandfathers had to, had to fight the Nazis, right? They actually had no option. They had to put on a uniform 
they had to get into airplanes because both of them both of them were in the air force and they had to fly over other people shooting them to try and kill them and they had to try and survive those three to five years that they were in active service and then they got back and they met my respective grandmothers and and all of this might not have happened but for a bullet uh, there might have been some Nazi who was a slightly better shooter who might have taken out one of my grandfathers. And I would not be here having this conversation with you today. And we'd be speaking German if we were. And we would, we would probably be watched by the Gestapo while we were doing it. There certainly wouldn't be podcasts. There wouldn't be the ability to partake in, in free expression and to decide what kind of a breakfast you'd like to have this morning. Those kinds of things we take for granted. And... I also get really annoyed when I hear people saying that they, you know, they fought hard for whatever they've got. And we don't even know the, the half of that. I, I struggled to get my grandfather to even talk about World War yeah. II mm. because he probably killed people. Mm. And that's not easy for anyone to get over. And when I did ask him about it, he would talk about it in very general terms. And he'd say, well, you know, the, the other guys, and we, we were a strong team and we did a lot together and, it was never really about him. These days, mm. all you hear from people is me, me, me. Mm. All you yeah. hear is, I'm struggling, I'm suffering, I don't have enough money, I'm not at the right university, I'm not allowed to study the course that I want, I don't have this and have that and have the other. And again, it's this, it's this ingratitude which grates me so much. Mm. Totally. This community, at least from our limited experience, which is a few years now building a conference is, is really built when you make it about the community and not about yourself. And so what I mean by that is, is the decisions that Dan and I made, uh, my business partner and I made, we, we, we decided from the very beginning, we would not purposely, we would not be the figureheads of podcast movement. We would not put our faces on all the logos and we would not take the stage at our own event and speak. You know, there's a temptation to do that, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what your goals are and what you're creating. Uh, but for us, we didn't do that. We believe that if it's true, if it's really about community, it can't be about us. And, and so we made that decision. And I think what's wonderful about that decision now, you know, being that we're going into our seventh event this next year, our seventh year, is the things that people would want from being on stage or from uh, having their face on the logo are, are things that now organically occur, but they occur for the right reasons. And and I, I think um, what that means is people look at podcast movement and they say, this is a successful event. This event's growing. Uh, this event has some buzz. This event is attracting certain types of podcasters and certain types of organizations. And uh, why is that happening? And mm -hmm. when the question of why is that happening is brought up, right or wrong it points to well who's putting this together mm. and when that question comes up that's where uh my name might come up or that's where dan's name definitely comes up uh, we're a team you know it, i couldn't do any of this without our team um, mm. there's no way i could do all this by myself i wouldn't even try so uh, but now that's that's really exciting is uh delayed gratification i guess is the way to put mm. it and not that i'm looking for gratification but uh, you know, the, that question's asked and people want to talk and like this podcast, they want to hear um, some of the stories. And, mm. and I think one of the big reasons for that is because um, we really made an effort in the beginning not to try to make it about us and, and try to genuinely make it about community, mm. uh, which resulted in uh, an op opportunity for true community to actually mm. grow. And, and we're still learning how to grow community. You know, we got some initiatives we're putting in place this year to, to continue to foster that and grow that. And, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's a lot of stuff I just talked about. I yeah. hope I didn't know too much, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what we believe. We believe, you know, in, in, in representing as many people and as many voices as we can. And, uh, the less we make it about ourselves, the more, we seem to, to see progress. <laughs> so, uh, we'll Love keep it. You know, it sounds out. like, it sounds like you definitely got your dad in you as well. Like just giving yeah. more than you receiving and, and just, um, you know, and that's, that's why it's become so successful as well is that you, you're doing this from a sort of a humble position, 
and uh, yeah, it's super inspiring. Seriously, that, that there's so much in there, like just to, just to unpack, you know. And and we'll definitely be doing that after well, after the show as well. But it's it's really really fascinating what you've done, and 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 really you. inspiring, you know. And and so and you and I can imagine your culture, um, as you mentioned, like would be representative of 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 that as well, which is what well, must be a great place to be working. Are, are the other like. Uh, is there any other sort of advice for you when you're sort of cultivating a community um, in the beginning uh, that you could give to our listeners or, you know, anyone trying to build a community? What, so what were some of the other sort of challenges and, and maybe some advice around that? Uh, well, well, we'll just kind of go back to the point mentioned, but, but to kind of dig in on, on it a little bit deeper is mm. when, when you're by yourself and, and you're wanting to do something that you feel compelled to do, the temptation is to, wave your arms and maybe stand on a soapbox and, and say, look at me, look at me. And in most cases, when you're waving your arms saying, look at me, nobody will look at you. <laughs> they won't mm -hmm. really care. Uh, but what people do look at is, um, is an army. If an army marches through a town, they, they see this army. And, and so then the question could be, how, how do you create an army? And, 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 and thinking about that, and in practicing, you know, some different ideas, you know, based on that question, a couple of things that came up is, is one of them is um, what I call being the noticer is starting out by saying, okay, who, who's my, my audience or who's my, um, my target client or uh, who's the person I want to read my book or the person I want to listen to my podcast or whatever it is. And, and how can you first start by noticing them rather than saying, notice me. And that may be as simple as making a list of two or three people or five people and saying, okay, I'm going to comment on their social media or I'm going to, you know, genuinely find ways to notice them, not in a contrived or a, a gimmicky way, but just a sincere way of, of noticing and, and being appreciative. And like I said, you can like their social media post or you can uh, leave a review on their podcast or you can, um, you know, comment on their blog or share their blog and tag them in a tweet or, or whatever it is finding unique ways to notice. And what typically happens when you, when you do that is I eventually start to, to look and see, man, that, that Craig guy, Gareth, he, these guys are really nice guys. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like I don't care what, I don't care what the internet says about them. They're good people. <laughs> and what, what, what's happening when you're doing that is you're creating rapport with someone and, and rapport oftentimes uh, when it's genuine and sincere, rapport will yield reciprocity. So you, you start out saying, uh, I'm going to notice someone else. I'm going to be sincere in that. That creates a rapport. The rapport will create reciprocity. So when it's your turn to come out with that book or launch that podcast or grow whatever idea you're wanting to grow and you say to someone that you're, you know, practicing this, this noticing uh, exercise with, you say to them, well, you know, here's something that I'm working on. In many cases, they're going to say, well, I really like this person. I want to support them. I want to tell people mm -hmm. about what they're doing. And you didn't force that, um, but they want to do it. And the reason they want to do it is because you've kind of hooked them up first uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in a genuine way. So if that's compounded over time where you're noticing people, uh, more than five people, 10, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20, uh, whatever that number is, but, but, but you're doing it again in a sincere way, uh, eventually enough people are raising their hand saying, we really like this, or we really like mm. this person. And that's, that's called the army. That's called building the army. So I hope I didn't take too long explaining that, but I, mm. I think for the person that's saying, look at me, instead of saying, look at me saying, how do I notice others? How do I build that rapport with them in a sincere way? Because that rapport will create that reciprocity. And when that's compounded, reciprocity creates an army and people notice an army. So if you want to get noticed, you got to start by noticing others. Mm. But I totally love that. It's such yeah. great advice, seriously. And it's like, it's not the advice you would expect to hear. You know, someone said like, you know, this is how you build a community. Like, it's and not it's, a quick, quick uh, yeah, fix. Unfortunately, I wish, I wish I had a quick solution. Yeah, um, but yeah. It, but yeah, but but I think the the lesson is also that nothing is actually quick. In, you know, it, it takes that effort to um, to grow something, and 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 yeah, wow. That, so so really, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, and also I was just wondering, like, uh, you actually uh, have had your mom on your podcast, and you interviewed her recently, <laughs> <laughs> which which I think is so cool. 
And um, also so important though, you know what I mean? Like, because you, you grow up with this lady, but you don't necessarily maybe know her that well. Like, you know, I guess not, I'm not just saying you and her, but like all of us in general. So what do you think is the say, importance of doing that? And, uh, you know, for people to tell their story. Well, my mom had some stories that I had not ever heard that were on that podcast. And my, my daughter listened to that podcast and, and in that particular podcast, my mom talked about growing up um, basically in a, you know, kind of a small poor town in Mississippi and, and they didn't have electricity or running water. They had well water and they had outhouses, wow. which is something that like most of us can't even fathom uh, <laughs> at this day and age. And so my daughter was asking questions about that. Like what's an outhouse and what is, you know, how do you, how does that even work? And, 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 you know, that was kind of funny. But yeah, that, that was a fun episode. And I, I did get a lot of feedback <laughs> from that episode. That's and what was funny is when my mom came to podcast movement this year, um, <laughs> she met a number of people there and they, uh, there were a number of people that said, I, I heard your episode. <laughs> you know? and, and and that was hilarious because she's, she's so new to this, like her just getting on that microphone. She didn't realize people were actually listening to that <laughs> you know? so for her to meet people that you know were, were saying i love the story that you told about whatever so it's just surreal for her uh but yeah that was that was a fun thing and i i think um maybe the takeaway is that yeah it's cool to uh to interview your loved ones every now and then uh if you have a podcast because you can share a little bit about them and kind of incorporate them into what you're doing and it makes them more excited about it as well kind of gives them a, a different view of the different projects that you're passionate about. So there's, there's a lot of good things that can come from it. And hey, yeah, like I've got a, a lot of. So basically going back to your story at, at this time, things weren't necessarily getting much better for you at all, actually, because you, you had a lump in your throat or you found a lump in your throat. So maybe you can kind of take us back to that day. Um, you know, what, what actually happened and then what, what happened afterwards as well. Sure. When, when I was first, um, so there's two rounds of college in Boston. The first time I went away, I was at Northeastern and that's when I really started to drink heavily and enjoy more of the party going out life. I ended up going through the first trimester and I almost, almost finished the first trimester, but it was the first time in my life that I wasn't getting straight A's. I was doing really poorly because I wasn't doing any of the work. I wasn't going to the classes. Uh, so I ended up dropping out and that's when I went back to my family's, um, home in Connecticut. And that already felt like a failure that to me was like a big, you screwed up big time here, Sarah, this is really not great. And at that time was when I had this lump in my neck since, uh, since I was in high school, but it just got bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it was. Uh, my mom urged me to go to get it checked out. Um, it was after I went to one of the annual checkups and she urged me to go get it checked out. And I did. And in that moment, the pediatrician called up to Yale New Haven hospital and got me an appointment to get a CAT scan of, and, uh, and later a biopsy, but it was to get it checked out. And I'm like, okay, what, what's going on here? And she's like, you just need to go there right away. And I'm like, you want to tell me anything? And of course, as doctors, they can't tell you anything because it's liability here in the U.S. So that's when I found out what this lump was, and it was being diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma two weeks later. <laughs> that at 19 is, you know, first it's dropping out of, high, of college. Then you're diagnosed with cancer. So it's like a double punch of what is going on. And your whole life flips upside down in that moment because things that you thought were important, like, you know, when am I going back to school? How's my boyfriend? All of a sudden, things like that don't matter. What still did matter was an eating disorder. And it's a really screwed up mentality to have an addiction like such because even though my health should have been the number one concern, it was still maintaining my um, my issues with food and how I was going to handle that. So that was being diagnosed and that kind of leads into where I was after. Hmm. And wow, it's it yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's just, well, what was it like? Like, I mean, was there a bit of time between the tests and the diagnosis? What was the time period like? And what was the weight like? 
you know, it's one of the worst things ever to wait between getting an exam like that and getting the results. Um, it's like the biggest limbo that you don't know. You can't sleep. You don't function 100% because you are in constantly this what if. And I knew nothing about yoga. I knew nothing about breathing. I knew nothing about mental health. Back then, it was just a survival mode. So you have anxiety and you're struggling with it on top of having a triple dose of anxiety because you don't know what the hell is your life going to be like in you know, however long. So it's a, lot of, uh, it's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of anxiety and uh, you don't know what your health is going to be like. So it's all the basic pillars of humanity that creates wow. us as human beings to be okay. It's just like, we're just going to pull all these out from you. It's hmm. like floating. Wow, Sarah. And, and I mean, it's just, it's hard to comprehend how you must feel in that, in that time. Did you have a feeling of like impending doom or did you kind of feel like this is not good or, or, or were you like, oh, it's probably nothing kind of, what, what kind of mentality did you have in that period? Great question. I think I wanted to believe that everything was fine. And that's probably what I tried to portray on the outside. Deep down, I knew something was wrong. I think, mm. uh, you know, if it's your body, you know, in your body, something's not right. How I always tried to portray to the outside world is that everything is fine. And that's mm. part of what I developed with in eating disorders. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm okay. But it's deep down stuff isn't okay. So you start to once again, develop that distance between mind and body even further. Wow. Mm. So, so you had that, you had that uh, lump on your neck for a long time then? It grew, yeah. It, be, it started as a bean. We called it a bean in high school because someone was giving me a neck massage. And I was like, what the heck is this? And I was like, I don't know. Let's just call it a bean. It's, um, it's, it was in my neck as part of the lymphatic system. But then it started to grow more and more to the point it was almost the size of a golf ball. So it was oh, really wow. not normal. Um, that was in my neck. So it metastasizes. And when cancer cells double, I mean, it's like compounded interest. It doubles mm. and doubles fast. Where was it, uh, Sarah? Like just on the side or down at the bottom? Um, yeah, it's, if you go down the scalenes in the neck, which is one of the neck muscles, so it's right above the collarbone. Yeah. Um, that also ties up to just under the ear. So there's a line uh, that goes from down the side of the neck. Uh, hmm. Those are all your lymph nodes, one of the main parts of the lymph nodes in your body. They run all throughout your body, but that's one of the main ones. Wow. And you ended up uh, actually going through 10 months of chemo and radiation and goodness, it just uh, must have been so tough. But what was your experience of that like during that period? I, um, when most kids in college were thinking about what party they were going to, I was wondering, am I getting chemo next week? So it really put me in the weird category for sure. Mm. Uh, the chemotherapy, I, I hated. I hated. I was fearful every day about if my hair was going to fall out. Mm. As a female, you really identify, and even males, and you identify with how you look. If you're already self-conscious about how you look and you don't like how your body is, and then, oh, yeah, we're going to make your hair fall out. It doubles the, I really don't like myself. Um, and even when people were like, oh, you have a cute, you have a great shape of a head. And it's like, that doesn't make me feel mm. any better. <laughs> wow. So I, but I fought and I fought for a long time. And there were ups and there was many downs. But um, especially I was in the PD section, which was a blessing because you're around a higher energy than when... Mm. I, I briefly was in the adult oncology. The adult oncology is really, at least when I was there 16 years ago, it's a really depressing feeling. You're just in these rows. It's like a cattle call and you just get plugged into your IVs. Um, I'm sure they've come a long way now, but it's still, it's not a pleasant experience. Um, for kids in PD, at least it was, I hate clowns. They had clowns. Um, they had dogs sometimes. Do you have like people who are a little bit higher energy and uplifting? Mm. It was sad, of course, seeing babies going through chemotherapy because oh. like I did dumb things in my life. Okay. So I get it. I haven't yeah. helped this situation, but that little kid was born into it. So 
there was also that heartbreak feeling. But at the same time, I took it as a responsibility for myself to stay upbeat, to stay strong. And I think that was an underlying blessing. When you're going through something like chemotherapy and, and fighting any kind of disease like that, you have to develop an inner strength and an inner resilience to keep propelling yourself strong and forward. And mm -hmm. that same thought process that wants to put you down, you just have to keep overriding it. And like, I'm rebuilding myself. I still struggled with the eating disorder. So it was, you know, really a, a, a split, a bipolar mentality mm -hmm. that I wanted this health, yet I wasn't doing the, st the steps to create that health. But then at the same time, you had the mental strength to kind of still be positive. It's really this weird mm. mix, isn't it? The mind has a really powerful capability. My mind has always been, I mean, all of our minds are super strong. The mind can override anything else within the body and our human capacity. Um, but at, my mind really just overrode everything. And it was like, what do I want? How do I want to be? And coming back to that idea that I was, I can be, and I was a chameleon. So the face that I was there was very different than the face I was when I was by myself. Mm. We can't not speak to you about the reason that we're actually speaking, if you yeah. know what I mean. So like you, you've put together this amazing video about street surfers and talking about pollution and stuff like that. Like, but it, it, it's honestly like for me, being South African, especially like it, it brought not only like uh, joy and, and like happiness to me, but also like tears, you know, like, like there's this sort of real kind of contradiction, I guess, of it in, in, a, in a great way. Um, can you maybe just tell us like how that came about, um, you know, doing that video? Thanks, man. Yeah, like so many people have, have said that they brought tears to their eyes and uh, mm. um I never, we, I don't think we ever expected it to, to go so viral, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I just want to say a big shout out to Corona because, you know, Corona is a massive global brand and this is, they paid for the video. Like this is their <laughs> video, you know? Like, and for them to not have branded at, like that at all really and like to really believe in, in, in getting rid of single use plastic and, you know, I've been wow. working with them a lot. Their, their beers no longer come in those plastic thing. Like they come in a cardboard box and like their whole office is plastic free. And hmm. to see a huge corporate brand like that, like really like um, live up to what they're saying, I think it's amazing. And those are the kind of people that can make a difference, you know, like yeah. if Coca-Cola suddenly like, we're not going to use plastic bottles anymore. Boom. That's it. No more plastic. That's, mm. You know what I mean? They could change the world tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, big shout out to Corona. Um, and then also iForce, the production company that I've been working with who, who put the film together. Um, they did an amazing job on the, the video, I think. Um, we actually, we did the, we shot that film three times before with another company. Uh, but the, the street surfers that we used then, we couldn't find them again. Because <laughs> um, we got them cell phones, but I think they either had them stolen or they got lost and we never, never found the guys again. And uh. I mean, how do you find, and then uh, it was hard to find people, I guess, you know, we went to Johannesburg and it's like, gonna go find some guy in Johannesburg with no ID and no cell phone, good luck, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. A big city. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the idea basically came around with Corona and their agency because they were trying to look at um, <clears throat> tying people who don't live near the ocean in Johannesburg and don't really have a connection to the ocean with the ocean and why they should try and protect it, you know? And that's kind of how the whole thing came about. And yeah, man, those two guys, the, making the film was, um, when those two guys came to Cape Town, it was, yeah, it was, I was also in tears there. Eh? Like, yes. um, Moketi and Tabu, they, they'd never had a shower before, bro. So they, like, we got them in Airbnb in Camps Bay and I had to show Tabo like how the shower worked because they don't have anyone. No way, but Yeah, it was deep, eh? Wow. So, I mean, it's 2019. I had to show him that to like turn the thing and the water comes out. It was just, yes, but... yeah, like we, no one listening to this has ever in their entire lives got anything to complain about because 
the those guys' life in reality is so far from anything that we've ever experienced. Like going there was just so mind blowing to me. <clears throat> um, especially going to his little those little sh- their little house, their little shack. Um, yeah, they have no running water, no toilet, so they have like poo in a bucket, obviously, in their little thing, and then they throw the bucket out and rinse it out and they collect water. Um, and there's like just dirt floors and they live in the the place is like a garbage dump, literally, because they separate the plastic there. But there's like this amazing sense of community in there, you know, like they see in the video, the guys, when we got there, the guys were making food and they're like, oh, you want food? Like, imagine going, if I went down the street and asked someone for food, they'd like chase me away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. There's this incredible sense of community and yeah, it was, uh, a lot of people ask me what now for those guys and I don't know what the answer is. I don't know, you know, I don't know what they, what we can do. There's a hundred thousand people in that community. Like mm. if anything, if that video just raised awareness about those guys and people, you know, from that, take, give them some respect, that would be insane. But yeah. Yes, man. I know it's crazy. It's just it's such a beautiful film, but seriously. And, um, <sighs> Yeah, man, like, yes, you said, like, even the stuff, well, there's stuff there that we didn't see, you know, which you just spoke on, like, you know, them never having a shower before. Not, never, not, really? I mean, I had to show me, never been into a shopping center. So I was like, when we were in Joburg still, I was like, look, you are the biggest legends I've ever met. And I was like, I'm going to buy you whatever you want. Like, let's go to the shop right now. So I took them to Mr. Price and I was like, you just pay, you buy whatever clothes you want, I'll pay for it. And, um, They'd never been into a shopping center before. They'd never been into a lift. The, like the, mm-hmm. the guys at the shop and Mr. Price were like, like, we can't, like the security was like, sorry, like uh, we can't really let these guys into the shop. And I'm like, what do you mean? And like, I mean, I, and I get it. The guys that were like street people, you know, like <laughs> it was mm-hmm. like quite a fancy mall. And I was just like, really, just buy whatever you want. Like I. You know, your this whatever it's cost me is nothing compared to you know like their experience, and they walked out of there with like the biggest smiles on their face, and they had like these shoes yes, and right. clothes, and um, just all those new experiences for them. Like when the lift came up, they never been a lift, and it opened up, and we were in like you know in those malls, you like come in into the shop, <laughs> and open up like in a women's section in Woolworths, and it was just like. <laughs> They were like, they've never seen so much just stuff in their whole life. Like all these Bad. things and mannequins. And that was all just like things they'd never seen before. You know, they were just like eyes like this. And I was, yeah, it was the, the whole thing was just, it was a complete trip. Eh? And like, hmm. yeah, it, just, it was crazy. Eh? Yes, but it's, just, it's so, the, the, the contrast of how, it's so stark of how, how much excess there is and stuff in our lives when you see it when i hear you speaking like that i just think yeah oh, like if you picture that scene there's just so much stuff everywhere and you think what what is it really all you i know, know? what's the stuff it's just Crazy. things you know that all those guys had with the clothes on their back and maybe one or two other things at home and it's like they were like what is what do you do with all this stuff like what do people do with it you know <laughs> like yeah, another yes. funny story is like i was like oh we're there and i was like hey we're gonna go like have an epic deal like, like we just get pizza like we're just, like buy the boys whatever they want and they're like and then we got like a super like healthy kind of pizza and I, I take the top of my kid to like trying to eat it they're like trying their hardest and they're like man this is disgusting and they're like they're like no ways they probably they like you can imagine like these guys are don't have much you would think they would be so stoked and they're like this they're like no we don't like this this is terrible you know they just wanted pop and chicken and like or like carb and like a meat they didn't want the food that we were eating i found that so interesting you know they, yeah yeah this they processed eat, rubbish like yeah thing. yeah <laughs> no but i mean what they eat is even worse it's just processed carbs it's just white carb it's the same but they're just like the, i don't know the, their diets are terrible and i think it's also a lot of why they're in this like you know it keeps you in that situation just eating that way like no vegetables just like mm. meat and divorce and I thought yeah. it was so funny. We took them to this fancy restaurant. They're like, nah, we want KFC. <laughs> <laughs> Good for them, man. <laughs> yes, but it's such yeah. a beautiful story, man. Yes. Th- 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 thanks so much for, Yassi, for 
we, we would have thank people like you for just doing stuff like that because it just inspires you know innumerable people it really is that inspiring and i think everyone that watches that whether you're south african or not will will get a, a tear in the eye because you can relate to the ocean or you can relate to you know there's so many things one can tr relate in in that video and it's, it's super powerful man so and it's re it's real it's not like i'm not trying to like um yeah. not, you know what i mean those guys aren't trying to pretend to be something that they're not it's just that's how their life is you know and that's those yeah. things that you saw like that was the first time they'd ever seen the ocean in their life like they'd never <laughs> seen the ocean they never left where they were like any i mean you can't fake that yeah no yeah. Okay. No, you're right, yeah, but... The whole thing was just like, yeah, it was just that. Crazy, yes, bud. So, yeah, but... Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold mountain range. Gotta be quick, so 